Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Future Proof. Good morning, Huntington Beach. Um, welcome to the panel, Metaverse and Beyond. We have a jam-packed panel for you. Obviously, no other, none other than Matthew Ball here. You've all heard the introduction. Uh, good morning, Matt. Good to see you. Absolutely. And today, we're going to break down everything about the Metaverse, the brave new world of the Metaverse. Because if you believe some of, of the hype and the Wall Street estimates, the metaverse is projected to be a $1 trillion market opportunity in the coming years. And that's according to JP Morgan, who earlier this year, they set up their storefront in the metaverse, complete with portraits of Jamie Dimon. They got live tigers. It's a whole bunch of fun. But they're not the only ones. We've seen Snoop Dogg you know, in the news buying lots. We've seen Paris Hilton has her own island in, um, in the sandbox, I think. Uh, even Domino's has storefronts in the metaverse where you can order a pizza in the metaverse and it gets delivered to your door in real life, which A, makes me hungry, but B, it makes me think about all the potential business opportunities that there are waiting to be discovered or really waiting to be invented inside the metaverse, which a lot of people are calling met metanomics, which is the economics of some of these communities. So let's dive right in. I mean, obviously there's, there's market op opportunities, there's sky-high projections, Matt, but still some people are a little bit skeptical or not 100% yeah. sure what it really is. What does it mean to them? Is it just for gamers, for people with virtual you know, headsets? And um, So maybe we start with kind of a high-level view of what does the metaverse mean to you, um, you know, one of the pre predominant experts in, in this space, and then we can dive a little bit deeper down the rabbit hole. Sure. So good morning, everyone. It, it's great to see you. What's interesting about the forecast that you provided from JP Morgan is they've been elevated significantly since. Goldman Sachs estimates that by the end of this decade, the metaverse economy be, will be two and a half to 12 and a half trillion. Citibank estimates eight to 13 trillion. Morgan Stanley is at that same range. KPMG says 13 to 16 trillion. McKinsey says four to five trillion. Now, ultimately, this is a question of allocation. There's no real alignment as what the digital economy is worth or what the internet economy is. When you purchase sneakers from Amazon.com, is that digital revenue? The shoes are made physically, they're distributed physically, they're purchased through an e-commerce channel. But what we're talking about here and what explains why every company is talking about the term, no matter the specifics of their business, why there's such large forecasts and why there's such hype, is because there's consensus that what this is is a elevation, a next generation version of the internet. And to put the internet in context, it's not any one technology, it's a system, an ecosystem that spans 200 countries, 40,000 autonomous network, millions of domain registrars, hundreds of millions of different servers, six billion people and 25 billion devices that can all coherently, consistently, comprehensively and reliably exchange information. So extraordinary is that technology that to the extent in which we do try to understand the digital economy, we value it at roughly 20% of world GDP, 20 trillion. And of course, much of the remaining 80% still runs through it. Farming is not the digital economy, but yields and the ways in which the yields are obtained are using digital and internet technology increasingly so. And so when we think of the metaverse, we're thinking of it in succession to today's predominantly mobile and cloud era, which itself succeeded the fixed line internet and personal computing era of the late 1980s and 1990s through the early 2000s. The technologies specifically that we consider are real-time simulation, a network of excuse me, persistent experiences, a join to fundamental overhauls to the standards and protocols that we use as part of the internet itself, and then supplemented by many new technologies which foster new use cases. Some examples would be cloud gaming, but on the entitlements, rights, and network architecture standpoint, we also see the emergence of blockchains, cryptos, and other attendant technologies, such as the NFT format and structure, or the DAO. Awesome. Yeah, well, you talked a little bit about architecture, and I think that's kind of what a lot of people understand about this, that Web 3 or Web 3.0, right, is different from kind of what we have now and some of the Web 2, which is kind of sort of more social media kind of architecture where you can, you have the ability to, um, you know, put out messages, but it's kind of under a confines of, of a certain architecture. So maybe you could dive into what Web 3 is. Is that really what's going to be kind of game changing in the future? So Web 3 is separate from the topic of the metaverse, but 
Typically, we see technological change brings about other technological changes. Typically, when we're talking about Web3, we're talking about a decentralized version of the internet, a new way of arranging and transferring information. It's likely that that underpins much of the metaverse economy, a 3D persistent real-time version of the internet. It may be that it's philosophically essential or technologically essential to realize the metaverse, much like we would say that capitalism is not necessary to have an economy, but we understand it to be the best way to have one, or at least thus far. But what's crucial about the Web3 movement and allows us to isolate to the topic of the internet itself is that there's a fundamental belief that one of the flaws of the internet, powerful though it is, is its distribution of value. This is called the fat and thin protocol theory that says if you take a look at the internet, it's owned by no one. It's a de facto public good. Yes, a government can exclude someone or a company, but no corporation can. And there are all of these protocols upon which the internet is built and other standards. Think of it as the IP address, for example. There are different ways in which networks identify one another. If you want to send a video conference file to England, you have multiple different networks which find one another. They know one another. They relay information, again, consistently, coherently, and reliably. That system is powerful, but we generally conclude that most of the value in the internet is on the application layer, built on top of that. Your IP address identifies your device or your network, but where's the real power? It's your account. Where's the real power? It's your social graph. Where's the real power? Who stores your photos, not who helps you direct your photos? And the result of that has been an ever-escalating feedback loop that those who built up those resources, your account, your login, your storage, your social graph, your data and history, are almost impossible to compete with, right? Mm -hmm. Instagram, extraordinary product, but now mostly insulated from competition, at least directly. And so the Web3 movement primarily says that we need to have the protocol layer fatter, the application thinner. You put your identity not on a user account that you build on Meta, but on the blockchain, thus pushing that information into the public layer, the public good, accessible to all. Whether or not that system is mature enough, technologically easy enough, or even powerful enough for all of its merits to supersede the billions of dollars being invested by for-profit entities is not yet clear. But this is what leads many to believe that if the internet was so transformative because no one owned it, mm -hmm. and the internet's arc has constantly privatized ever since, that Web3, ushered in by the coincident rise of a new computing era, gives an unprecedented opportunity to reset that balance, and which may actually be the best way to build that future. Hmm. That's fascinating. Well, we're at a wealth management conference, so let's turn to some of the investments side of things. <clears throat> in terms of what's happening with um, ETFs, at least, there's been a fair amount of, um, of assets moving into metaverse-focused thematic ETFs. Uh, I just saw this week, in Europe, three new metaverse-focused ETF launch uh, this week. In the US, I think there's about six or seven. Um, so far, one of the leading ones um, being the Roundhill ETF, um, I think it has around 800 and something um, in AUM. And yeah, I think we have 88% market share domestically. 88% market share, yep. And obviously tracks the, the index, the ball metaverse index that, that you guys came up with. So um, where are some good investments? Like what is going to have the most, how is the metaverse going to have the most economic impact do you see? Or how are you playing that in terms of these ETFs? Sure. So look, history tells us that there are four primary categories that are going to be complete, uh, particularly valuable. One is to recognize that we have always had scarcity of computing power, partly because every time we have more computing power unlocked, we tackle more complicated problems. And those who have the expertise there, either in chip design or GPUs, NVIDIA, Intel, AMD, or who operate the largest data centers, if the metaverse is to be realized, its demands on computing power will far exceed anything that we've previously imagined. Intel, by the way, estimates that a 1,000 factor improvement in efficiency will be required. They're going to be primary beneficiaries. Mm. The other will be to take a look at the various hardware providers, whether that's today's giants through the smartphone, smartphone form factor, or new extended reality, mixed reality, AR and VR devices. In either regard, those companies end up being the essential access pathway to all digital and virtual experience, which is likely to provide extraordinary benefit in addition to the 60% gross margin we typically see. The third category tends to be those who transact 
virtual and digital experiences, which today are largely stitched together with those hardware providers. This is why we see lawsuits in the Netherlands and the EU, Japan and South Korea, on whether or not a hardware provider, an operating system provider, has the right to mandate their payment solution be required. But separate from that, new economies bring about new payment rails, and whether we're talking about Shopify, Square, Stripe, FTX, crypto at large, it's very clear that that payment network, if we're going to see trillions of dollars emerge, is going to be particularly valuable. Mm -hmm. And the last category is when we take a look at the simulation systems themselves. Those who actually operate the virtual atoms of a parallel plane of existence, write their physics, and manage the consumer and business-facing platforms. That's your e-commerce when you're talking about purchasing something, or that's your consumer-facing services. And so this is where you get the theory for Roblox and Fortnite, Minecraft, the digital twinning platforms of Microsoft and others. But even when you take a look at NVIDIA, which is trying to build what's called literally Earth 2.0, a virtual reproduction of the entire world that can be used to simulate interconnected simulations of large-scale infrastructure, bringing together what today is the Hong Kong International Airport, simulated down to the individual, the tarmac, the flight, the gate, connected into the entire ecosystem around. In short, one should think of the world as the world's best development platform. Almost none of it is legible to software. When it is, it's highly asynchronous and non-collaborative. And so we see many companies, Microsoft and NVIDIA in particular, trying to build a development platform for all of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, super interesting. And um, no, those are, those are strong plays. I think you mentioned the cryptocurrency and some of these crypto underlying cryptocurrencies of some of these communities. I think there's Mana is one of them, Send is one of them in, in the Sandbox. Um, I actually wrote a cover story earlier this year for Investment News where I dove into seeing if advisors could buy land or other things on behalf of their clients in the metaverse. Turns out you can't. Um, there's a bunch of custodian kind of issues there. But one way to get some of these exposures, especially on the, on the ground floor, is to purchase some of these cryptocurrencies. Um, you know, I know we have a lot of advisors out here. Is that, a, is that a kind of a smart way to get in kind of on the ground floor and, and to get into some of these cryptocurrencies that under kind of pin these, the, the metanomics of these communities? Yeah, so it's interesting. I mean, there's a few different ways to break this down. Right now, there's a debate among many crypto believers and non-believers as to whether or not virtual real estate, scarce goods for which proximity matters, is valuable. I'm actually not sure whether it is. And one of the good ways to think about that is what's valuable in real estate in the internet today? It's your .com and how many letters it is and whether it's .com, .org, .ca, .net. But we don't think of proximity online, right? You don't say I'm going to the internet homepage, then I'm going to navigate to Google, then Google Docs, then Google Docs folders, then a Google Doc. You just go specifically to where you want to be. And so there are some who believe in crypto, but don't believe in building virtual proximity in land. Mark Cuban, a very large crypto investor, has called it the dumbest thing ever. <laughs> there are, literally, the, there are others, Andreessen Horowitz, who believe that that degree of cohesion and culture that comes from having neighborhoods and the endemic value of having adjacency, not just a dot-com, but who your dot-com is beside, matters. These theses are gonna be borne out over time. But the more important way to think about this answer is we're still thesis-driven, and that's pretty common. We were actually still thesis-driven in the 2000s on mobile. That's why few companies built what Amazon did with AWS, why Microsoft was kicked out of mobile entirely at the hardware and operating system layer. And so my perspective here is diversified exposure. You've got some consumer-facing platforms, Sandbox. You've got other tools-based companies. Then you have the underlying blockchains and the layer twos on top of that. There's a company here, Bitwise, I partnered with to produce another thematic index that tracks 42 different cryptocurrencies and tokens to try and provide that diverse exposure as the entire ecosystem grows. Mm -hmm. There are a few different tokens that I hold with disproportionate allocation in my personal account, but I'll frankly tell you that I think it's hard at this point to have absolute certainty versus get a pretty large basket for your clients. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I just want to remind everybody out there that on the app, you can ask questions. We'll get them to Matt. Um, so please, if you have some, we have about 15 minutes left. There are some coming in, um, so we'll do that. I think you just answered this one for announcement. but it says, can you provide some examples of use cases for the metaverse as it pertains specifically to wealth management? I think 
I guess these ETFs can help some clients of, of advisors, also some of the cryptocurrencies. Are there other ways that Metaverse can, can gain exposure to their clients? Yeah, so there's really diff three different ways that you can look at it. Most of the major banks and other wealth management institutions, Fidelity through to Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, are varyingly recommending a 1% to 2 or even 5% allocation to a total portfolio towards the crypto economy. Even Tim Cook, who doesn't allow most crypto experiences on his platform, has said that he has exposure to cryptocurrencies, believing it's an important exposure opportunity. Helping your clients go through that on a basic perspective accumulating a few as either a hedge or asymmetric upside, which is typically how these systems works, is important. There are also specific products that you can look at where you're talking about NFTs or virtual land, again, which are a lot more thesis and what you think the view of the future is going to be. And then the third category is when we turn into various yield generating businesses. You need not worry about something such as Celsius per se. But there are certainly mechanisms where you can take your extant crypto investments, stake them, or lend them out to third parties who are then providing you yield for their usage. One of the challenges of this is while there can be a positive return or yield from lending out effectively or collateralizing your securities, the variance in the underlying securities price is tending to warn a lot of people off. Put another way, you might be able to generate six or seven, eight percent per annum, but it's also quite possible that within a month, the underlying security that you've locked away for two to three years sees daily or at least weekly or monthly variances in excess of that IRR. And so this is where one gets into more complicated hedging strategies, trying to tailor the overall mix of a client's portfolio to the specific opportunity at hand. But there's a remarkably large group of individuals that are going after this. And then other funds which are producing their own thematic indices around collections of NFTs, Bitwise being another example there, or providing broad swap-based exposure to lending as opposed to lending the assets yourself, mm -hmm. for which, again, as wealth managers, managing the custody of those assets is going to be key as well. Mm. Maybe we can dive into this staking a little bit, um, as you said, and, and finding some yield from some of these things in there. Um, I, I talked to an RIA out of um, in Alaska, I think, and they bought a, a, a piece of land uh, in Decentraland. They wanted to think about staking it to see some things about that. They were also thinking about, I mean, it was mostly a marketing play, I think, but I, they also wanted to see if they could hold webinars, in the, if they could do job fairs, if they could do kind of bring real life things, maybe they could charge for some of these, um, you know, content and things they could produce there. But in terms of staking, it, does that make sense for some advisors to try to find some land in there? Is, is that a viable way for to, for, a custom, for their clients to kind of bring in income? It can be, but again, this is where we has, ask that question of what's the purpose of the client's investment? Again, one thing that you can do, of course, it can be tens of thousands or $100,000 plus exposure. And again, there are still debates as to whether or not these have underlying utility overall. Mm -hmm. And so certainly offsetting that investment by instantly staking it so that you're providing benefit to yourself from non-operation of the underlying security can be a key piece of upside. One of the things that we've certainly seen in these virtual real estate platforms is that someone will purchase it. They don't have practical use for it, but they know that that land is going to appreciate. And so rather than do what many in Manhattan do, which is just operate a corner store or a gas station, low capex overall so that they can sit on the land as it appreciates, they say it's virtual property, and so let's just stake it out to a third party who's effectively lending it. Yeah generating passive income while you have additional passive income as it grows. This is where we're talking about the complexity of what you actually do and do not want to provide a client in these different realms, managing for underlying thesis questions. Hmm. Super interesting. We'll go to the TV prompter here. We have another question from Anonymous. Um, within your venture fund, what types of companies, products, technologies are you most excited about? Sure. So I primarily focus on two different things. One is if one believes in the metaverse at large, and by that I would actually reduce it to just the idea of a 3D network of simulations, the tools to actually build in 3D space are extraordinarily hard. Think about all forms of content today. All of us create text, all of us create images, some of us create audio, some of us remix content. It's very clear that as the barriers to content creation go down, new UGC platforms comes up, the picks and shovels argument applies, and those organizations which assemble enough of those tools end up having quite a powerful SaaS business. This is what Epic and Unity and others have built, Unity being its own situation. And yet 3D remains extraordinarily hard. 
So I spend a lot of time focusing on investment companies that make it easier, better, faster, cheaper to build more monetizable experiences in 3D. It's actually primarily for the industrial and enter enterprise economy. I do a lot of investments into the virtualization of oil and gas pipelines or architecture, real estate, even agriculture. And then the second category that I focus on is a lot more of the consumer-facing opportunities for how consumers are going to interact. I'll give a simple example. We tend to assume that each time we have one of these platform eras, the major UIX models change, you see minor iterations of the old thing through the new form factor. If you go back to the late 2000s, online dating was considered a solved problem. You can see this in every single magazine, Harper, New York Times, The Atlantic. And what was the answer to online dating? It was spending two hours filling out a 300-question survey on Match.com and eHarmony, which would then give you four matches scientifically proven. Mobile was not just Match.com for mobile. It flipped everything about that. It's not a survey. It's a picture. It's not two hours. It's three seconds. By the way, the average man spends three and a half seconds on a Tinder match. The average woman, 6.7 seconds. Fundamental shrink of interaction. Your interaction not based on actual chemistry match as designed by the survey, but broad attractiveness scores. Of course, it essentially flipped when you determine what part of the dating ecosystem. And so for my consumer platform investments, I'm primarily looked at those companies which actually assume that human interaction will be less similar than similar. In effect, not what about Tinder in 3D, but what's the 3D version of Tinder? Cool, no, interesting. Um, and that explains a lot about men and women, I'd say, probably, right? Um, so anyway, another one up here. How do you explain NFTs and what direction will that space go? We've heard a lot of it you know, in the last couple of years, not so much recently. Uh, what's your take? So NFTs actually solve two really interesting problems for which I'll admit that those who believe in them and the metaverse at large are still uncertain as to whether or not they're the best instantiation overall. But they're, they are solving a problem. And that first problem relates to the fact that many have wanted for what we call interoperable entitlements in digital space before. The problem with that is, what system do you use? Some have been proposed, but none have scaled. Some have been proposed, but they haven't proven to be more remunerative. We've seen scalability in the NFT system, at least operationally. We've seen incredible sums of money attached to them. And critically, they don't require theory. Many different developers can look at it and see exactly what's being deployed. And that connects to the second problem, which is when these systems have been proposed, they're coming from a for-profit corporation who owns much of the standard or operation. And so you have this problem where everyone who does believe in the outcome says, that's great, but you own it, and I don't want to empower you further. And so we see scalability, we see compensation, and we see an unowned standard, perhaps not perfect, but the internet itself is not perfect, but which everyone can opt into. And so that's why people get excited about NFTs. If you believe in a virtual parallel plane of existence where things have value, you need an economy that can actually operate the exchange of information and goods without actually obligating you to a single owned, potentially oscillating in its priorities platform. But the other thing that we have to think about is where we talk about the failings and inadequacies, at least, of the internet itself. The internet today primarily works on copies. When I send you a file, we both have copies of it. In fact, several servers have a copy of it, our device has a copy of it, your Gmail has a copy of it. And so anytime you want a synchronous shared experience, the internet kind of fragments because you can't have consensus. And so when you're using an NFT-based system or any blockchain-based system, it's very clearly establishing what is the property and good of record, not just in terms of ownership, but in the establishment of the record of truth. And so this allows us to say, yes, the internet is fundamentally copying data all the time, but at this point, the copying process is simultaneously establishing authenticity and individuality of that good. Hmm. Yeah, super interesting. Well, we'll go back to, we have three audience questions. We have just under six minutes left. This one's from John David Ricker. I like this one. What are some habits of human interaction with technology that will prevail in the future. We talked about online dating. What do you think are some of, the, some of the habits that are really going to see the most technology advancement? Well, so one of the things that I find relatively easy to believe in is that an ongoing share of human time, labor, leisure, spend, wealth, happiness, et cetera, will exist inside these virtual worlds. 
Sometimes we find this to be contrarian because many imagine, what would I want to do in a video game? I don't want to do that. And there are two answers for that. Number one is we're often using the internet without actively doing it. You check out at the grocer, you walk into a building, you press a crosswalk sign as I did moments ago, and you're accessing the internet. When you go into an Amazon Go retail store, you're recreated in a 3D virtual production. Johns Hopkins is now performing live patient surgery using 3D networks of data and XR. And so many of us will exist inside 3D virtual spaces without actively choosing to do so, not even for leisure. But the second and more important thing is to recognize that like the internet and mobile before it, the ongoing generational adoption of these platforms is irrefutable. Think about the common example. People make the point, we've been here before. That's right, it's Second Life, and that came and went. It had the Time Magazine cover, and then we forgot about it. Some stores stood up shop, and then they left. I've been on stage now for 26 minutes. More people have joined, Ro have logged on to Roblox in the last 26 minutes, times two, than the peak monthly active users of Second Life in 2006. An extraordinary increase in the size of these ecosystems. Over a 24-hour period, 58 million people will use Roblox. On a monthly period, you're talking about 275 million people, and that's one platform alone. 75% of children in the United States between 9 and 12, as well as Australia, Canada, New Zealand, United Kingdom, use Roblox alone on a regular basis. This is partly just generational familiarity and transition. And so the simplest answer when you're talking about what parts of human behavior is, a, we can already see it, but the broad consensus is that almost all of it will. Jensen Huang, the founder and CEO of NVIDIA, a company built for exactly this moment in time, which is why it was so shocking to everyone as it surged to become one of the most valuable companies on Earth, has estimated that half of world GDP will be in the metaverse. Again, a question of allocation for which he provided no specific timeline, but it's based on the premise that everything that we do, as with the internet today, will be supported by real-time collaborative simulations for grocery for interaction, going to a sports game and having a beer. Hmm. So let's go, that was a little bit more theoretical, maybe a little bit more practical with a couple more questions left. We have three minutes and counting. Um, but this from Eric C. It, how would you, if you're starting a new business, a new business person in the metaverse, you want to create a presence, you want to reach out to new clients and prospects, um, how would you go about doing that? Obviously, you want to get a piece of land, possibly you want to start, start your storefront. What are some practical tips to, to help that people want to get involved? Yeah, I think the more important thing here is, irrespective of the platform that we're, well, actually, I'll take a step back. There are really two different problems when you think about standing up virtual presence for your clients. Number one is those platforms which provide the most flexibility, this is your decentralized platforms, your sandbox, and so forth, tend to have very few users. In fact, Decentraland and Sandbox are usually between 10 and 250,000 monthly active users. Again, there are about 6 million people logged on to Roblox over the last 30 minutes. The flip side of that is those which do have a lot of users tend to offer very limited flexibility today. They're tightly controlled ecosystems. And then thirdly, you have the question of access. Some of these launch from a web browser. That's good for many of your clients. Some of them require a 20 to 30 gigabyte installation on a device first, plus an account and a complex onboarding system. When you use Oculus, it can be fun. It still takes people about 15 minutes to familiarize themselves with the interface. But then, of course, they need the onboarding exercise of where do I go? Why do I do it? Do I need to build an avatar? And so the reason why I say this is not to say that there isn't opportunity here. South Korea has said that every single government job within five years, they want to be virtually recreated, 40,000 individual employees. The crown prince of Dubai has made the same statement. But unless you can answer why you're doing this for which of your clients, beyond marketing, beyond showing that you know how these platforms work, unless you can explain specifically why that is key and why that's better than a video demonstration, live or pre-recorded, you're probably going to find out that the exercise is more laborious than it is useful to the client. Mm -hmm. and so I would just say, be a little bit more specific. You want to say you've bought a plot of land, sure. You want to put up a virtual billboard, sure. You want to host a meeting in VR. These can all have good purposes, but you need a second click beyond, look what we can do. Yeah, absolutely. So one, one left. Um, what's stopping companies from creating unlimited metaverses and effectively destroying the scarcity? Well, look, I, I, I wouldn't mind a reduction in the scarcity of a number of different things, but I think the more important thing to do is to take a look at this from an economic opportunity perspective. I'll give you my favorite statistic when you talk about non-scarce goods. 
Fortnite was in 2018 and 2019, we don't know the financial since, the most remunerative game in history, generating about 3.8 to 5.5 billion dollars per year in revenue, net revenue. That system was almost 80% cosmetics with no functional limitation, and those cosmetics had no scarcity, unlimited supply of these virtual goods. That 3.8 to 5.8 billion, less 20%, exceeded the gross revenue of almost all of the most prestigious fashion houses in the world. J. Crew at 2.5 billion, Saint Laurent, 2.5 billion, Lacoste at the time, 2.8 billion, Prada, 1 billion, Fenty, 300 million. And so we see clearly a system where purely social signaling based goods, not inherently scarce, but scarce by the time they're available, buy them now, was handily beating with a much better margin profile almost all of the biggest and most storied brands in the world. And so I don't worry about the scarcity question. Thank you, everyone. Awesome. Yeah, we'll have to leave it there. Thanks, guys. I'm looking forward to see what the metaverse looks like in five to 10 years. We'll have to wait and see. Matt Ball, I learned a lot. Hope you guys did too. Thanks. <laughs>